Hello to our biocognitive community. My name is Samantha and I'm the Chief Experience Officer or the CXO with BSI. Um, and Dr. Mario and I today are going to be talking a little bit more about an upcoming workshop called Why Addiction is Not an Illness. Um, during the conversation today, we're going to talk more about the context of this debate, this controversy that people seem to have, um, and also invite you to the upcoming workshop, give you direction on how to get in. Uh, one of my um, passions here is talking more about public health and healthcare service. So we're gonna be going at this from a little bit different angle. Instead of talking to you as a general public, we're gonna talk a little bit what it's, a little bit more about what it's like to be a service provider in this field, um, but also what it's like to be a family member or someone who has been tagged or, or pinned with the label and identity of addict. Okay, so my first question today is tell us a story about one of your first experiences in the world of treatment, because I think a lot of people don't fully know your background and why you are so passionate about this topic. So what's, what is your first, your introductory experience into the world of illness or addiction as an illness? As a clinical neuropsychologist, I started my practice and did some hospital work and it was mostly uh, just general psychological, psychiatric problems. And then I got in, involved with addictions, working with addictions in uh, different hospitals. And I directed some uh, programs in, in addictions. But I always felt that uh, what was happening is that people were taught to uh, disempower themselves. They were taught the model of illness, the model of disease. And I always found it that, that it was just uh, really replacing one addiction with one dependence or one addiction with one compulsion and an example of that would be if you are a heroin addict the best that can be done for you is methadone which is another opiate but it's a uh, it's the same thing uh, or if you're an alcoholic uh, or uh, an alcoholic anonymous or narcotics anonymous you replace one addiction with a dependence smoking religion um, sex uh, gambling um, and uh, AA, NA, and you're really not dealing with the issue. And that to, to me seemed to be a problem. And the research is coming from something that was done back in 1956 when the uh, Medical uh, American so Association uh, determined that uh, alcohol was an illness. And from then on, and it was for a good cause, it was an illness because uh, if you see it as an illness and you can have treatment for it, you can have insurance covered treatment. So it was a very good uh, cause and, and a very good intention. But the problem is that people have been stripped of their, of their agency. Uh, and it's not about uh, whether you have an illness or you have a lack of uh, any kind of uh, will, willpower. It's not that. There are very clear neurological, genetic kinds of components to it. But that's what is showing in the brain. And that's what is showing in, in your psychoneurology. But it doesn't mean that it can't be changed. And it doesn't mean that it has to be an illness where you can see yourself as sick rather than someone who has a type of, uh, I would call it a, uh, a propensity to go for pleasure in the wrong places. And what we teach is that uh, you can change brain chemistry. You can change uh, brain uh, neuropsychology by the kind of things that we teach in, in addictions. That was a, a long answer for a short question. That's good. Um, you talked a little bit about the frustrations of this model, but can you go a little bit deeper into um, the world of an actual healthcare service provider, either direct service provider or being someone who has created models, being someone who has trained other service providers, what has been the biggest frustration in the perpetuation of this model? Like you mentioned, it started back in the 50s. Here we are in 2021 using the exact same model, even though people in healthcare talk about innovation. What's been the most frustrating part of actually being someone uh, told to deliver stuff like this to the community at large? 
the model has failed miserably. It has about a 58% success rate. Uh, AA cannot be studied because it's anonymous, so you really don't know what's going on there. Very well-intended people, but these are addicts helping addicts. These are not professionals. They're, these are not uh, scientists. So you don't progress. Before, you would smoke in the, in the room. Now, the, even the AA has a joke about it. They say, if you want to find out an AA meeting, go to a place that has a lot of people smoking outside. So what is what are you doing? You're replacing one addiction with another. It's not a it's not a cure. And why is it not a cure? Because in that model, it's a, it's something that has no cure. And I think that's wrong. I think it's bad science. And uh, I'm providing something that will be totally different. And this is why I'm doing a workshop for general public as well as for professionals to let them know that uh, here's something to think about. If it's a disease, it doesn't matter how much work you do, whether it's AA or whether it's an intervention with cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever it is, and you've been, you've been detoxed and you've gone through it. There's a point in your life where something called decision, agency, determines whether you're gonna do something or not. You can't do that with an illness. You don't wake up in the morning and say, today you're not gonna have cancer. It doesn't work that way because that's a real illness. Addictions are not illnesses. They're sociocultural uh, extended uh, expressions of looking for desire, looking for the uh, pleasure in the wrong places. And I'm well aware, which I will explain in the workshop about the uh, dopamine, uh, the dopamine receptors, uh, the R4, uh, um, and, and all of the LLs, the, the 7R, all of that, I'll talk about that. But that doesn't mean that because there's some neurochemistry going on that is an illness. The same neurochemistry goes when you're falling in love. So do you have a, an addiction to love? Or there's neurochemistry when you go to the bathroom. So what do you have, a, a toilet disease? It, it's crazy when you look at it that way, but you have to have good science to back it up. So the issue here is how do we teach agency? Not uh, the power of, of will, not, not that how do we teach agency and how do we change one desire for another, not one dependence for another. That's the difference in what we do. It's beautiful. Um, having come from education and healthcare, both of us, one of the things personally for me that, that I find so profound in biocognition is that you always talk about creating hybrid models and finding the best of what's already out there and pairing it with either something totally new or the best of something from another um, sector or industry. So from healthcare and wellness right now, where do you find hope? Where do you see the, the glimpses of innovation? Um, or what do you think is the best part of the model that we do have? Because it's not, it's broken, it's not working for a lot of people, but there's gotta be something good in it. So from your perspective, what is the good? Where is the, the good? Is, uh, for example, if uh, the good, if somebody needs to be detoxified, they need a physician and they have to be detoxified there. So the hybrid would be the detox detoxifying with a biocognitive model. If someone is attending AA, AA with a uh, biocognitive model, so you create hybrids, you don't throw away what you're, what, what, what's been done. You just improve it and you make it work with the concept of breaking away from the, from the idea that it's not curable. Now, there are some people, a, per, a small percentage of people who can never drink again or who can never do drugs again because they, they don't have the either the capacity or the neurological uh, makeup to make a difference. But those people are not sick. You can look at it and you can say you have an allergy to alcohol. And allergies are not illnesses. They're just over responses from the immune system. If you have an al allergy to peanuts, you don't have an illness, you have an allergy. And if you see it as an allergy, you're still not sick. You're still not, you haven't lost your agency. You have decided to not do something because your body doesn't like it. That's it. So uh, the, yes, you're right. The, uh, the hybrid is really a very important component. We don't throw away. We add to whatever people are doing to give you an additional component to go into independence and be treated, but not necessarily be treated as someone who is sick for the rest of our lives, and you, and the identity is around your illness. Hello, my name is Mario, and I'm an alcoholic. No, my name is Mario, and I'm much more than anything else. But you're given that label, and now you're an alcoholic, and that's your identity. You have no other identity but an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm not an alcoholic. 
but if I were, I wouldn't say that I am. I would say, I'm Mario and I'm, I'm struggling with alcohol, I would say. Uh, and by the way, when I, when I've divorced, I drank every, every weekend excessively. I could have been seen as an alcoholic. It was a reaction that I had to my helplessness, my guilt, and all these other. After a while, I stopped drinking excessively, and now I have a glass of wine with dinner. I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, so, but if I would have gone to a place in those times, they would have said, yes, you have to look here. You have all the symptoms here, excessively out of control and all these things. So you're an alcoholic for the rest of your life. You go to AA, and that's it. So I was able to liberate myself from that, never went to that. And here I am teaching people how to do it. How can people pick out um, models or opportunities that they might see um, if, if a traditional model of recovery or healing or growth has failed them supposedly and they're looking for something and anything, how, do they, how can people identify a model that has totally trashed the models that you're talking about, the, the medical model, and be aware of the dangers of some new models that are out there that are just a replacement or a different fix. Any model that says that uh, you have an illness and you're sick for the rest of your life, is not a good model. It's a model of helplessness, a model of giving in. Instead of saying, what can we do to actually cure this? Which means by curing means that uh, you choose to drink or not drink knowing the consequences. And if the consequences are that you can't handle it, you don't drink anymore, it becomes an allergy. If you learn social drinking, that's possible. Social drinking has been really bad as far as a outcome because it's been done wrong. It's been done by replacing rather than looking at the issues that are going on. Some of the issues that are going on with the addicts uh, and alcoholics is that um, you there's a tendency to not go inward very much. There's a tendency to not be very introspective. There's a tendency to not uh, be able to delay your rewards very long. All those things come from the first two years of the neurological processes that go on in the gyrus and the sul sulcus and that part of the brain. But that doesn't mean that's not reversible. The brain is plastic. The brain has ways of changing things when you give it the right information. So uh, what I'm saying is that look for models that do not see you as having a disease, but having an issue that is workable without having to identify yourself with the illness. Uh, you don't go around and you say, hi, my name is such and such, and I'm a, a diabetic. You don't do that. So why should you do it with the, with the uh, substance abuse? I also want to uh, differentiate in, in the workshop, I'll do this, between addictions, compulsions, and obsessions. They're very different, and they're used interchangeably, even by professionals doing it wrong. It's wrong. They're different, and they have different neurochemistry and different way of treating it. So I hope you uh, join us, and uh, we'll be doing quite a bit there uh, to empower you, but give you science behind it, not just good thinking or or, uh, or helpful kinds of ideas that are not going to work for you. This is good science. So thank you. What's a final message that you would have, first of all, for healthcare providers, people who are helping people with addictions or suffering from what you're talking about? And on the other hand, what would be a message that you have for families and individuals that are working on growing out of this? One of the problems with practitioners is that if practitioner in a model of the, of the medical model wants to go into this model, they're gonna have a hard time keeping their jobs. So that's a real problem. Uh, so what I would suggest is that maybe they can incorporate some of the things even without necessarily saying that it's not an illness, but doing things that would help it as if it were not an illness. Uh, and the families also is that not to buy into that concept that because you have family genetics, that you're an alcoholic and there's an alcohol gene. There's no such thing as an alcohol gene. There's no such thing as an alcohol uh, anything other than a conglomerate of neurochemical, neuropsychological, psychoneurological processes going on that make you a higher propensity to abuse but it doesn't mean that it can be reversed. So uh, although we don't do treatment, we train trainers. We have done treatment for many years, and now we think that it's better just to work with trainers so then they can do the work. But thank you. That's a, that was a very good question. And again, where can people sign up for the workshop? The workshop would be, uh, all, they, all you need to do is go to biocognitive.com, 
my website and you will see upcoming events and there's one on uh, addictions which is coming up now i think the 11th uh and uh it's uh why addictions are not an illness and i have other uh, workshops coming up but this is the the most uh, recent uh, that we'll be doing so i hope that you sign up and let your friends know and try it and see what happens you'll see some good science there and you'll see how i allow the evidence from the good science to come in and yet it can be debunked that not that it's not real that it doesn't leap into extrapolating it into an illness that's the key there wonderful thank, thank you so much my pleasure.